And uh, we're nicely back on track. So I would like to introduce Darius from MasterCard, who's slightly controversial, is going to touch on some of the points that Todd raised about do we need uh, more regulation or are we okay um, as we are? What I will tell you is that um, there might be um, a little bit more regulation coming in in January or, or more of a, a bit of a to-do list even for uh, the industry. So Darius, I am fascinated by uh, the insight you're about to share. Thank you very much. Darius from MasterCard. Thank you very much, Helen. So the controversy starts right now because I haven't actually got any slides to distract you with. Um, I thought that just the thought of presenting right before lunch will be distraction enough, okay? So, so let's start right there. Um, my name is Derek Nechrbecki. I lead our well, MasterCard's strategy in open banking. And rather than um, kind of talk about concrete use cases or API specifications, I just want to share some reflections as to where we see the open banking slash open data ecosystem kind of now and where it's heading tomorrow, uh, both in Europe, in the UK, in Europe, and also, and also more globally. So very much keen to hear whether this will resonate with you or whether, whether you, see, you see things completely differently. Um, I must say, you know, listening to Jamie right at the start um, brought me back to probably my favorite childhood um, author, who was um, Robert Louis Steven, uh, Stevenson, um, whose birthday happened to be yesterday, which is why this joke doesn't exactly work today. Poor prep. Uh, but he wrote a book called Tre Treasure Island. Now, I hope some of you have heard of it. I won't exactly spoil the plot by saying that there is a treasure. Um, there is a group of people who jump on a ship to get to an island to dig that treasure up. Um, but when they get there, they open the chest, and the chest is empty. Now, I won't tell you exactly what happens around it, but the whole point is that this, is, this reminds me a little bit of what, where we are with open banking today, right? We've been promised a massive transformation, but it hasn't happened yet. It's at best very early stages. Um, and some of the stories that Todd and Jamie bring up about why are exactly right. So if you think about UK for the moment, yes, it's 18, 18 months down the line of the industry, or should I say the largest nine banks, having had a play at this. Just about everybody else is still in the forest. The rest of Europe, yes, ecosystem has been live for two months, allegedly being tested for about six. But again, the performance of APIs for major financial institutions across Europe is at best questionable. So whenever we talk to some of our partners, big and small, um, they keep on bringing up the fact that they are not fully able to actually build any tangible use cases today to test and prove their business cases. And in particular for fintechs among them, that's particularly um, stressful because you only have so much time to actually prove yourself before you run out of cash and, and you're in trouble. So interestingly, we're also in this weird situation whereby some fintechs are actively choosing not to try right now, waiting for the, for the banks to become better and their, um, their APIs to improve over time. Now, of course, how are the banks meant to get better without seeing some live traffic is a whole other, whole other question. So, Possibly a little bit of a catch-22 situation developing, in particular in the smaller European countries uh, where there isn't that much kind of traction and volume. But as, uh, again, Jamie kind of pointed out right at the start, open banking is not new. And the whole principle of taking data out of a financial institution, or indeed any institution, and taking it somewhere else, using it for some other purpose, has been done for years with uh, various forms of screen, scra screen scraping and credential sharing. The problem with those modes of access is precisely that. Sharing an individual's username, uh, password, name of cat, and whatever else to enable authentication to happen behind the scenes with complete lack of control as to what data is being extracted from the institution in the first place. But it's, it's absolutely true that for now, credential sharing 
plus a form of screen scraping or reverse engineering or whatever you want to call it, remains the most reliable way of getting access to information just about anywhere in the world. Uh, and the best examples of players that do that, so the Yodleys, Plaids, and others, uh, typically originating out of the US market, that's, that's a, a, exactly the sort of access that, um, that enables thousands of fintechs being developed kind of in the, in the US market as an example. I think, but it nonetheless begs questions on uh, data security and individuals' credential security. Um, ones that I think kind of bubble up to the surface more and more as we, as we get into this world of open banking. I think there's a number of other issues that, uh, that Todd in particular pointed out. So, um, yes, API performance is, is atrocious. Yes, um, in the European context this is. Um, yes, some of the use cases that people may want to be building aren't actually enabled in the APIs. Uh, you know, recurring payments today being probably one of, one of the hotter ones. Um, the need for customer authentication taking place with every single immediate credit transfer is very limiting. I think, ultimately, when you think about how the banks have approached this topic today, it is to do largely with the regulatory ecosystem that's being set up, in particular in Europe, which prevents the banks from effectively making money um, out of access that they are forced to provide. And that's, that's fatal, in my view. It's fatal for a number of reasons. Um, it doesn't create any incentives for the banks to stand up high-quality interfaces. Um, it creates very little incentive to evolve those interfaces over time. And it fundamentally deprives the consumers from having access to high-quality use cases that they may want to um, they, may, they may want to have access to. I said consumers, I should say customers, because everything that we talk about here is just as true in, in the consumer space as it is in business. And that's a problem, but that problem is also linked to the liability that, in particular, financial institutions need to be prepared to accept in the world of open banking. There is no mechanism, or very limited mechanism, I should say, that PSD2 provides for a financial institution to go after a third party that has done something wrong. In particular, if that third party is a small fintech who, if enough fraudulent cases happen, will go bust. And so, so well, and that's basically goodbye to the funds that have been lost, um, where the bank is basically just left out with reputational damage of having done something that they should have done or had to do. Um, but the consumer wasn't protected, or the business was not protected enough. And we think, you know, at MasterCard, we see all of these issues as potential roadblocks from this ecosystem scaling up. I think one other key aspect here is, is this whole topic of data protection and consumer protections. Again, there is very little in the way of consumer protections as far as PSD2 is concerned. Um, with regards to account information and payment initiations. And that's wrong. You know, from the world of operating uh, one of the world's largest payments networks, we know that that's not the way to build an effective, scalable payment ecosystem. And exactly the same applies to the world of data exchanges. The fact that the world of moving data between party A and party B is new, and there isn't really a, you know, price point for getting that movement wrong is not is, 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 is basically where we are today, but it doesn't mean that that world doesn't need fixing or doesn't need more standards or more guidance as to what those consumer protections should be. And I think this, this is also <laughs> closely linked with very different approaches that regulators or the industry has taken in different parts of the world. So in Europe, yes, we've got aspects of regulation that's basically more or less being copy-pasted into places like Australia, New Zealand, as you heard, with various, various tweaks, but still very similar looking regulation in places like Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, Brazil, Mexico are coming online, Canada, the same. 
So there is definitely a, tre a global trend towards similar type of approaches, but all of these places are missing a couple of aspects of making sure that A, on the supply side, the providers of data actually have some form of long-term value that they can benefit from, rather than just being forced by regulation to open up in what some argue is a little bit of an unfair competition, because why should the banks open up but social media sites or the big techs don't? Yeah? Australia is obviously going a little bit further to also expanding access, regulated access to utilities, but that's still not a level playing field. So time and time again, we hear about um, banks in particular complaining that, you know, I need to open up, but look at Google over there or Facebook, they don't. So, so interestingly, I think we're at the stage where some of the parts of this ecosystem are still to be uh, kind of Part of the aspects of how the data sharing and how open data sharing we'll see in this ecosystem is to be worked out. Todd very helpfully showed a number of use cases that, um, that we are likely to see evolve over the next couple of years. I think he's quite optimistic at the speed with which we'll see them take up, but if you go to any payments conference, um, you know, credit decisioning and something to do with credit will be the number one use case that everybody is quoting, open banking will transform. Again, what open banking can do today in those spaces is actually fairly limited. Access to one's transaction history, yes, and enables you to confirm with fair degree of certainty whether somebody up to this point in time has been employed. Yes, you can, without, not without its difficulties, but verify their income. Um, but you still cannot, through open banking interfaces, confirm their address or address history. One of the key aspects of, um, of a mortgage application. You cannot confirm whether they are over 18 for the purpose of selling them restricted product. You need some form of additional bit of data to confirm that. Which is, which is exactly, you know, I totally agree with Todd that the world of open banking and digital identity become very intrinsically linked and very quickly because just the basic data opened up via, via sort of open banking interfaces is not enough. And we're going to be seeing financial institutions, among others, allowing consumers to use themselves as basically providers of trust or basically as, um, institutions that confirm that an individual possesses a certain quality, i.e. maybe has a university degree, is of a certain age, has worked in a, uh, has worked in a certain company or maybe uh, lives at a certain address. All of those are examples of what we would class premium or commercial APIs today. And I think we will see those APIs emerge it's very early days in European context. Uh, there's probably a handful of banks that have actually deployed some form of commercial API. And I agree, more will come online as time goes on. But my key, my key premise here that I wanted to share with you is that regulation as it stands today is not sufficient to bring about that market outcome unless there is a set of principles in place that enable that outcome to be sustainable. And that is anything from making sure that there is actually a fair transfer of value that gives the provider of data the incentive to open up and keep the connection open to a high enough quality, that there is a set of rules that actually govern how, if something goes wrong, the two parties should get in touch with each other and resolve the problem. So again, think of it this way. Imagine you're... Um, you're powering, imagine you're a lender, okay? And I come to you as a customer and I say, hello, can I, can I please have a loan so that I can buy this new car over here? You can absolutely ask me to give you my transactional details from my current bank account. And off the back of that, maybe you can see that, oh, you know, I've got 5,000 pounds in my account and therefore, 
I'm likely to be able to afford repayments. Oh, and my disposable income looks like it's at a certain level, so therefore I can afford it. All great. But what if, what if I then default on that loan? And it actually turned out that I emptied my account that very morning, but that my bank didn't pass all that information to you as a lender. Well, who's at fault then? That's, a, that's an example of, of a very simple use case for which we don't have a very good answer today, certainly not through regulation, but one that needs to be answered for this ecosystem to ever have a chance to kind of scale in, in, in a way that everybody hopes it will scale. So that, that treasure chest that I mentioned at the start kind of starts to actually magically fill up with stuff rather than remain empty. And I think one other, one other thought before we move to questions is um, I, think, I think everybody is kind of fixated on this idea of killer app for open banking that will revolutionize this. Um, we talked about the issue of trust right at the start of consumers in particular feeling a little bit wary about sharing their data, you know, seeing their bank as, you know, that strong, stronghold of financial information where nobody should have access. I think, I think that's a slightly wrong way to think about it. There's no way to educate people, consumers or businesses about open banking that's ever going to overcome those inhibitions. The way to do that is to actually build use cases and solutions that embed open banking functionality but don't openly talk to open banking being used. I mean, leaving aside the fact that nobody, I'm guessing, reads the pages and pages and terms and conditions that are, that are attached to uh, granting an open banking consent, the way to explain what open banking does is to actually say, look, you will get this mortgage approval within a minute if you just do these few simple steps here. And yes, in the small print, there is, there is regulatory um, kind of, there is an AISP that needs to do something and you give them consent, but people don't care as long as they actually get that mortgage offer within a minute. And I think that's, that's the key. So whenever somebody asks about, um, what, what will be the Uber of open banking, my challenge to them is that's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is you will be exposed to it whether you want, well, whether you want it or not. You will be given the option to give your consents for certain stuff. And rather than ask about what open banking is, ask what you as a consumer or a business will, will get out of it. So as MasterCard, we thoroughly believe that this is the next wave of financial disruption. Um, we're building a set of services and products that help both third parties and banks operate better in this space. And everything I said about this need for kind of greater standards, um, greater rules or greater clarity in the ecosystem is also an area that we're working very actively on. Um, and just to close the loop on the, on the reference to um, Robert Louis Stevenson, I hope you know, Treasure Island was just one of the books he wrote. He also wrote a book about um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which, um, but hopefully you'll come out from this, chat, this, this speech and remember it more as a Treasure Island, rather than kind of a slightly odd guy talking with two kind of split personalities on the stage. So I thank you for your attention, but I'm happy to take any questions you have. Hello. Thank you, Darius, for this uh, great presentation. We have time for one or two quick questions. Thank you, Darius, for a great presentation. Um, certainly agree with you about the reciprocity and the uh, liability concerns where regulators need to step up and, and still somewhat immature. I was uh, scratching my head a bit on the transfer of value argument. Uh, frankly, don't you think that the market is going to provide enough incentive to the large banks to open up uh, rather than say, oh, the regulators should somehow build in uh, the uh, clear transfer of value back to those opening up their data? Uh, because frankly, 
the PSD2 legislatures weren't shy about the reason they were doing this, concentration of capital, right, in, in, in very few hands. So one of the reasons for open banking is to change that. So yes and no. If you, if you take the premise that one of the underlying reasons for PSD2 or the access to account part of PSD2 is to um, introduce greater competition in retail financial services. I mean, that, that's the written objective. L let's look at what happened in the UK over the last two years. Yes, you have a rise of neobanks, but the market share of the top four players hasn't really moved an inch. Uh, yes, it's early days, and you know, maybe it's the start of something great to follow, but people don't magically start to switch their retail financial provider just because open banking is happening, or at least they, they haven't to date. Totally. No, I agree. Well, my point was slightly different because I, I think, you know, looking at market share, active accounts and stuff, we can, we can argue forever about this. The point, the point is more fundamental. The point is we have in the regulated portion of PSD2 an, an ecosystem whereby <coughs> banks are forced to pour tens of millions of pounds into financial transformation that enable opening up. Um, the only player that they can charge for those kind of services is their own end users, or they, they all, their own account holders. I'm saying that that's slightly counterintuitive because the party that actually stands to benefit the most in addition to the end user is the third party provider that either does, a, um, you know, either does some sort of payments use, payments use case or uses the data to provide some kind of additional service. And as we move away from just the payment accounts to which PSD2 is restricted to the world of just about anything else out there, so savings, loans, insurance, investments, wealth management, uh, management pensions, and so on and so forth, what I'm postulating is that for that ecosystem to start to thrive, we need to see some form of value transfer from the third party provider back to the bank or back to the provider of data, more generally speaking. Thanks, Darius.